my guest there. Uh, Christian is professor of civil and environmental engineering at that uh, department and also in the department of biomedical engineering, both at the University of Michigan. He's the program director of the university's environmental and water resources engineering. Professor Lastowski conducts research on the impact of energy production and consumption on the environment, quite an impactful research, and the development of technologies to reduce pollutant emissions. Specific topics of his research include carbon capture and storage using novel synthetic adsorbents, the fate and transport of halogenated substances in the environment and life cycle assessment of the environmental impacts of lithium ion battery manufacturing and battery use in electric drive vehicles. He serves on the editorial board of two prestigious journals, Sustainability and Environmental Progress and also Sustainable Energy. He was the 2012 chair of the environmental division of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers and conference co-chair of the 2017 Research and Education Conference of the Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors. I cannot read the full bio. I hope that I have done a little bit of justice here to just give you a little bit of uh, a brief introduction about his line of research and impact. Please do also visit his page and uh, we are pleased to have him today with us today. His talk is about decarbonization, decarbonizing freight transport, the mobile carbon capture from heavy duty vehicles. Uh, Christian, thanks once more, the stage is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Hadi. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Uh, thank you for that very nice introduction. And uh, I wanna thank the organizers for the opportunity to share some of our work on the subject of how to target carbon capture from heavy duty vehicle fleets. Uh, so uh, as Sergey mentioned, our first speaker, uh, we have a stabilization target of greater than 80% of current CO2 emissions from all sources in order to get to a stable CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Uh, this would include focusing on transportation sector CO2 emissions. So even if we capture all of the immobile source CO2 emissions, we're still probably going to need to capture roughly half of the current transportation sector emissions in order to meet stabilization targets. And so currently transportation is about a quarter of total global emissions. About three quarters of those emissions are from road-based vehicles, uh, roughly split between light and heavy duty vehicles. And so heavy duty fleets are about 8% of the total global CO2 emissions, a, a substantial amount. Uh, transportation became the top emitting sector by end use of energy as of 2016. And it's, it's projected to remain so throughout uh, the next several decades. And so this is a compelling reason to focus on transportation as a, a target of CO2 reduction. As you can see, uh, the uh, projected, uh, this is data from the US Energy Information Administration, the projected reduction in carbon intensity for transportation sector uh, is going to lag behind that of other sectors such as industrial, as we heard in uh, the last talk, as well as commercial and residential. And part of this has to do with the slow rate of conversion of fleets to electrification. So when we think about a solution to transportation sector CO2 emissions, um, one question that comes up is, well, why don't we just electrify every vehicle? And certainly this is a, a laudable goal. Um, and we have seen some growth in electric vehicles on the highways, be they hybrids or fully electric vehicles. Uh, penetration has not been as fast as some had hoped. I recall there was a Obama administration pledge of a million electric vehicles on the highways by 2015. And well, we haven't gotten there yet, but we are making progress. Uh, current EIA projections have us passing the million mark threshold in total battery electrics uh, sometime past 2030. Uh, the, the projections, however, suggest that vehicles powered on liquid hydrocarbon fuels, such as gasoline and diesel, are going to retain the highest market share uh, through the next several decades. And so 
uh, electrics haven't penetrated the market as fast as we'd hope because of ongoing uh, high battery costs and concerns uh, about uh, onboard specific energy uh, energy density, which limits uh, you know, the, the, the penetration and the adoption. Other possibilities to decarbonize transportation might look at biofuels or fuel cell vehicles powered on hydrogen. But there are questions, uh, doubts that have been raised about whether uh, the carbon footprints of producing ethanol from feed crop fermentation from corn and soybeans and other types of, of feed crops are, are truly carbon negative. Uh, as for hydrogen, the, the perplexing question there is where to obtain the hydrogen and the, the lowest cost uh, path to producing hydrogen is through steam methane reforming, which has a, its own carbon footprint. Uh, a few years ago, we did a life cycle study looking at the adoption of natural gas as a transportation uh, sector fuel, uh, comparing uh, the carbon footprints of vehicles powered on compressed natural gas, uh, battery electric vehicles that use electricity produced through natural gas combined cycle power plants, or fuel cell vehicles using hydrogen from steam methane reforming. And we considered you know, the latter two options uh, with the possibility of, of stationary capture at the power plant or at the uh, the natural gas reforming facility. And the, 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 the bottom line, the takeaway here, when we look at the, the global warming potential uh, for vehicle miles traveled, and this was based on a light duty vehicle uh, passenger sedan, uh, is that uh, fuel cell vehicles have a significantly higher uh, carbon footprint uh, than battery electrics. Uh, and, and this has uh, a lot to do with, with the fuel cell stack itself and its use of uh, very carbon intensive metals that have to be sourced such as platinum as a fuel cell catalyst. So uh, direct air capture is yet another suggested technology uh, for uh, harvesting CO2. In other words, let the CO2 from gasoline and diesel powered cars and trucks go into the atmosphere and then we pull it down from there. Uh, a direct air capture technology then uses chemical scrubbers to remove CO2 directly from atmospheric air where uh, you would call the, the concentration is now exceeding 400 parts per million or 0.04% by volume. So uh, these are very large capital intensive systems. Uh, companies such as Carbon Engineering in Canada and Climeworks uh, in Switzerland have uh, proposed these types of technologies at scale. Uh, and the cost estimates vary pretty widely. Uh, uh, some which have it as low as $60 per ton of CO2, uh, others which project it in the hundreds of dollars per CO2 range. Uh, the high-end estimates are based on uh, a second law analysis where if we calculate the thermodynamic minimum work for gas separation uh, using the Gibbs equation, you can see that that uh, to, to completely separate uh, a multi-component gas mixture containing CO2 and other uh, gases to purify the CO2 at, at ambient temperature. Because of the much more dilute composition of CO2 in atmospheric air, where we have a dilution factor of about 250 when it leaves the power plant stack or the uh, vehicle tailpipe, uh, we're starting uh, at a much more dilute initial condition, uh, which uh, the consequence of which you need about triple the amount of energy input, a minimum work to uh, purify the CO2 from that initial state than you would if you capture from a more concentrated source, such as uh, a coal fired boiler or an internal combustion engine. And so uh, this gives us uh, a certain amount of margin to work under if uh, direct air capture is the well, I like to call it the give up and front approach to <laughs> transportation sector emissions. Um, so uh, the case I would make for considering uh, carbon capture for mobile source emissions, uh, therefore it would be, we've seen a slower than expected uh, trans, uh, trans, uh, uh, transition from uh, internal combustion engine vehicles to battery electric vehicles. And, Many IC engine powered vehicles are expected to be on highways in the US and around the world uh, well into uh, this decade and the one that follows. Uh, 
a battery electric vehicle also is only as uh, uh, carbon uh, neutral as the as the electric grid uh, fuel mix that powers it. So if we are going to transition to a renewables intensive electric grid that is heavily invested in solar and wind, uh, we then begin to have reliability concerns because of the non-dispatchable nature of those energy resources. So unless we make a large investment in nuclear fission energy as a low carbon intensive electricity source, uh, where there's a considerable reluctance to do that because of cost and safety concerns. We're going to continue to need a certain amount of uh, hydrocarbon fueled uh, electricity uh, to ensure reliability. And so this would again require us to make further investments in stationary carbon capture. Uh, as noted, the carbon density of biofuels and hydrogen production uh, make them questionable as, uh, as routes to future carbon uh, uh, transportation sector neutrality. Uh, the direct air capture penalty uh, of dilution into the atmosphere makes it thermodynamically and therefore economically expensive to reconcentrate CO2 to levels that are suitable for sequestration or for uh, use as a feedstock. I'd also note that many regional economies about the world uh, are still heavily invested in fossil fuels in production as an export economy uh, and for importation for supporting uh, domestic industry. And when push comes to shove, uh, local economics, you've seen examples, will prevail over uh, shared global environmental concerns. And so it seems sensible to me to uh, pursue technologies uh, for fossil fuels that would uh, enable their continued use uh, through a capture and storage technologies. Uh, I happen to be an all of the above approach type of person. I don't think there's a single silver bullet to solve global climate change uh, concerns. Uh, I'm an active supporter of uh, battery electric vehicle technology development. Uh, and so I by no means think that uh, electrification of fleets and other technologies involving hydrogen and direct air capture should, should not be pursued. However, I think there is a case to be made that we should also pursue technologies that could directly remove carbon dioxide uh, from the tailpipe emissions of IC engine vehicles. And so with that in mind, uh, what might a cold mobile source CO2 capture system look like? Well, it would have to have the following elements. Uh, clearly, we would need some sort of onboard separation unit while the vehicle is in operation. Uh, we need some sort of a regeneration procedure uh, to uh, remove the CO2 which was collected uh, and to allow the medium to be reused for the next driving segment. And so that regeneration could potentially happen onboard the vehicle or perhaps uh, the capture system could be offloaded and replaced with a, a fresh capture medium, uh, which would allow uh, an easing perhaps of the time constraint to regenerate uh, the capture medium and to send the driver on his or her way. Uh, so we need a strategy for offloading recovered CO2, as well as some sort of an infrastructure for either CO2 utilization or storage. And that last bullet would be a common element for any type of CO2 capture system for the transportation sector, whether we're doing displaced capture from stationary emissions, say from a coal power plant making electricity to power electric vehicles, or for direct air capture from the air. So when we consider these, um, uh, you know, these needs. Uh, on reflection, uh, we decided, uh, it, it, we came to, to, to the conclusion that heavy duty vehicles represent a more attractive point of entry for a mobile carbon capture system than would a light duty vehicle fleet. For the following reasons, uh, light duty vehicles have significant mass and volume constraints for an onboard CO2 separation system that could capture as much as 75% or more of say the trunk space of a passenger sedan. Uh, and so, whereas heavy duty vehicles uh, have considerably uh, more mass and volume to work with. Now there certainly would be a, a penalty in terms of the mass and volume of, of the tonnage of freight that could be moved if we have an onboard system in say a, a class seven, eight tractor trailer. However, uh, there is a, more of an opportunity to uh, to introduce an onboard capture system. Uh, 
if we focus on HDVs. Uh, a further potential advantage is that uh, heavy duty vehicle traffic is, is limited, more limited to major roadways, such as interstate highways in the United States, than light duty vehicles, which may be uh, more populous on two lane roads, for example. And so we could consolidate uh, the infrastructure for collection of CO2, perhaps at uh, truck refueling stations along major uh, interstate corridors, such as Interstate 70 and 80, uh, through uh, the Midwestern United States. Also, uh, relative to the number of heavy-duty vehicles, they, they represent a large fraction of CO2 emissions for road-based vehicles, as you can see uh, in this plot. Uh, for about 5% of the number of heavy-duty vehicles, you see that they have uh, nearly half the emissions of light-duty vehicles, which are more, much more populous in number. And so heavy-duty vehicles represent a disproportionate share of the emissions. And that means that we could also make a bigger dent in the CO2 emissions from road-based vehicles if we focus on heavy-duty vehicle mobile carbon capture. Uh, there's been significantly less policy emphasis to date on CO2 emissions from heavy duty vehicles. And so if um, you know, adopted policies would reduce, if current um, policies that have been uh, proposed for emissions from LDVs and HEVs were adopted, uh, we would reduce emissions from the light duty fleets by about one third, but from heavy duty fleets by only about 10%. And that's because only four nations uh, well, the EU has recently also passed some policies focusing on heavy-duty vehicle CO2 emissions. Uh, but again, there's, there's much more from a policy as well as um, uh, uh, an emission fraction standpoint, uh, much more to be gained from mobile carbon capture from heavy-duty fleets. So what would a system actually look like technologically speaking, hypothetically? Well, if we borrow a page from how stationary carbon capture, stationary source carbon capture is done, uh, current demonstration projects focus on solvent-based capture using amine, so that's, uh, uh, amine solvents such as monoethanol amine, where we have uh, scrubbing of uh, CO2-laden combustion exhaust uh, through uh, an amine solvent column, uh, which is then desorbed uh, by the addition of steam to heat up the adsorbent to break the chemical bond which forms between the carbon dioxide and the amine active ingredient. Uh, because of the nature of that chemical bond, uh, this is a very energy intensive process. And so there has been a lot of interest in next generation capture systems, uh, either for stationary and perhaps mobile capture that could use physical adsorbents uh, to achieve the CO2 separation from the uh, combustion exhaust. These might be conventional adsorbents such as zeolites and activated carbons, as well as designer materials such as metal organic frameworks, uh, which could have properties tailored specific to CO2 capture. Uh, in the work that I'll talk about this morning, um, which was funded by the US Environmental Protection Agency, uh, we considered the design of an exchangeable pack bed zeolite absorption unit uh, for CO2 capture and offboard regeneration. And so such an adsorbent bed might, for example, be outfitted to fit a top or to slide underneath uh, the trailer portion of, of, a, of a tractor rig. Uh, one could also put such a unit uh, behind the sleeper cabin of, of the tractor. So uh, the general idea, regardless of placement, would be to pass the exhaust gas from the diesel tailpipe across a packed bed of adsorbent, uh, which would selectively separate the CO2 from the combustion exhaust. So a uh, typical uh, uh, class 7 8 truck might have a 50 feet foot long rig. So this could be a uh, absorbent column made of three inch diameter stainless steel pipe, uh, which fit into an enclosure on top of the trailer shown here. So the concept uh, for heavy duty vehicle carbon capture, the concept would be to place this absorbent bed to intercept the CO2 emissions. Uh, we then offload uh, that absorbent bed during a refueling stop uh, apply some source of uh, process heat, which could then devolve uh, the captured gases, which in addition to CO2 might also involve uh, moisture, water vapor from the combustion exhaust. Uh, we would then need to uh, dry uh, the exhaust uh, 
the, the CO2 enriched uh, product stream, uh, either for underground injection and burial in a geologic formation, or perhaps for use in enhanced oil recovery operations, which could then uh, close the carbon loop, so to speak, uh, in the transportation sector. So some research questions pertaining to heavy duty vehicle carbon capture that we're interested in would be on the economic feasibility side. Is this approach viable compared to alternative decarbonization options? Uh, and would the uh, technology result in a decrease in global warming? Uh, as well as what would be the technical uh, challenges, such as what kind of material might we use to capture CO2 and how would that material perform under realistic exhaust conditions? Uh, we carried out an economic analysis uh, comparing the, uh, which would summarize the total cost of onboard operation of the system, as well as uh, after the CO2 was offloaded, the cost of compression, transport, and storage, and then the capital cost of such a unit, including supporting infrastructure. Uh, some of the assumptions we made in the economic evaluation, uh, we used a payload of, as you can see, uh, 20 tons, uh, a class seven, eight, uh, seven or eight truck with a fuel economy of just shy of seven miles per gallon, uh, emits from diesel fuel combustion, 10 kilograms of CO2 per gallon of fuel that is burned at a cost of $3.15 a gallon. Uh, an absorbent with a 20 weight percent capacity, which we found was the case for some of the zeolites we tested under static absorption conditions, uh, could be utilized. Uh, now, as we capture the CO2 and store it on board, we have a, a fuel economy penalty of 3% uh, increase in mass uh, or, or decrease in fuel economy for each 10% increase in payload mass. So we looked at what would be the cost for um, capture for 250 miles uh, worth of driving, which would require about uh, 3,600 kilograms of absorbent for 10 weight percent capacity or about half of that or 20 weight percent capacity. Uh, and then using a minimum work calculation with a second law efficiency of 40%, an electricity cost of 13 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, so uh, also some regeneration using steam uh, at $2.50 per uh, thousand pounds of steam and then compression transport and storage costs at $20 a ton or a credit of $20 per ton for enhanced oil recovery for that scenario. So I'll cut to the chase um, and show you the results. Uh, one problem in, in projecting the cost is how to factor in the capital costs of a hypothetical system. Uh, in the case of um, uh, stationary capture systems, uh, costs there are about, uh, for CapEx are about half of O&M costs. For direct air capture, uh, uh, published work has suggested that it's about double O&M costs. So, the capital cost could range anywhere from 50% to double the O&M costs for such a system. So we took into account an uncertainty by looking at different scenarios. And so here's a, a summary of, you know, the piecewise contributions to total operating costs uh, uh, for, for dollars per ton of CO2 uh, capture, taking into account uh, the cost of separation at the bottom, uh, the weight penalty, compression and transport or storage and EOR costs in the next two bars, uh, a 25% contingency factor, and then finally uh, the, the capital cost contribution to the total cost. And so if capital costs are double uh, O&M costs and we have geological storage as the endpoint for the CO2 uh, recovered, uh, we're looking at a projected cost of $130 per ton of CO2 uh, captured from the diesel emissions. If capital costs are equivalent to operation costs, uh, that is more around the, about $100 a ton, uh, again, for geological storage. If we're doing, uh, for that scenario, enhanced oil recovery with the CO2 for utilization, uh, that might drop to $80 per ton. So uh, the heavy-duty vehicle carbon capture projects to be economically competitive in our analysis to alternative routes for transportation sector decarbonization, including uh, stationary carbon capture paired with electric vehicles on the highways, uh, also um, compared against direct air capture where there's a much larger potential uncertainty. Even if capital costs are triple O&M costs, uh, that would still have us probably in the 150 to $180 per ton of CO2. Uh, in regard to technological implementation, uh, we did some analysis of possible adsorbents we would use for physical 
absorption capture of CO2 in gas emissions, uh, tailpipe emissions from diesel combustion. This involved laboratory scale testing of various materials, taking into account their storage capacity, selectivity for CO2, tolerance of moisture, and so forth, as well as their commercial cost and availability. Uh, and required us to consider static uh, absorption testing at elevated temperatures, more representative of diesel uh, tailpipe exhaust temperatures, at partial pressures of about 14 kilopascals, or 14 volume percent near atmospheric pressure in the exhaust gas blend. We also considered the effect of capture under dynamic conditions, under flow conditions, rather than static absorption conditions. Uh, here are some results from our lab of um, static absorption isotherms for CO2 uh, on different types of candidate materials. And we uh, zeroed in on zeolites of having a, a good combination of capacity, selectivity, um, a relatively you know, uh, uh, reasonable heat of absorption uh, to desorb the captured CO2, as well as being affordable since they're already used at commercial scale, unlike a lot of the metal organic framework adsorbents, which have not been scaled for production. Uh, as you can see for zeolite 5A, for example, uh, as the temperature increases, the, uh, uh, the, the loading at 14 kilopascals CO2 pressure uh, decreases significantly. And so uh, we have a fractional uptake reduction as much as 40% uh, or so as we go from room temperature uh, up to a temperature of 75 degrees Celsius. So uh, as we um, consider the temperature uh, effect of capturing CO2 at elevated temperatures on such materials, uh, we have a 48% capacity reduction under static loading conditions relative to ambient temperature capture. Uh, that's for static loading. What about under dynamic testing? So we have a bench scale apparatus that was uh, used to evaluate uh, capture under flow conditions at the EPA laboratory in Ann Arbor, Michigan for National Vehicle and Fuel Emissions Research. And uh, we looked at uh, both dry uh, exhaust blends uh, as well as blends that included moisture using a bubbler to introduce uh, water vapor into the blend. And uh, we see that there is competitive absorption, particularly with moisture on uh, uh, Zeolite 5A, our leading candidate material, which introduces a further penalty on uh, the usable adsorbent surface area because of this competitive absorption with, with water vapor uh, on, on the zeolite material. So now we're, uh, we've uh, lost about half of the available adsorbent surface because of co-adsorption of water. If we then uh, carry out scale testing of the material, uh, and here's work that uh, my co-author, Dr. Christina Reynolds did in the dynamometer lab at the EPA lab uh, across from our campus. Uh, using actual uh, diesel engine exhaust as the feed into uh, an adsorbent apparatus that had uh, 25 kilograms of the adsorbent, so maybe at a one-tenth scale model. Uh, here we're seeing that the uh, uh, now at, again at elevated temperatures as well, with 10 weight percent uh, CO, uh, 10 volume percent uh, moisture in the exhaust, as well as about 12 percent CO2 by volume. Uh, we find that. Uh, we have a, a capture that's about 30% of the room temperature static uptake uh, adsorbent volume uh, or, or adsorbent capacity. So uh, that means we need to nearly triple the amount of adsorbent we might want to use uh, to, to capture the adsorbent volume uh, that we get under room temperature static conditions. And that would obviously penalize the onboard mass uh, uh, of the capture unit on the trailer and therefore significantly reduce the additional remaining payload weight that be, could be hauled by the trailer. Uh, we think there's some workarounds for that. For example, we could utilize heat exchange with air-cooled condensing or a, uh, a desiccant system uh, that could uh, dry the exhaust and limit the co-adsorption of water vapor. If we can cool the exhaust down to about 40 degrees Celsius, we should get condensate to removal of, of the water vapor. Uh, and so some of the mathematical modeling we did uh, in heat, uh, heat transfer analysis suggested that we could, um, you know, with, with uh, sagacious use of heat exchange, we could uh, utilize three quarters of the uh, adsorbent capacity uh, of the static limit and get it to around 15 weight percent uh, capture on uh, a zeolite such as 5A or 13X.
And so uh, I'm nearing the end of my allotted time, so um, I'll have some concluding remarks, but I'd like to first acknowledge the sponsorship of this project and also my co-author, Dr. Christina Reynolds, um, uh, former student within my group who is now a staff scientist at the EPA lab and uh, also acknowledge the help of some other personnel at the lab who assisted us with the experimental program of testing and economic model development. So my concluding arguments for this uh, case for mobile source carbon capture are uh, the following. Uh, the the heavy-duty vehicle carbon capture abatement costs we project would be in a range which is on par with other transportation decarbonization strategies, including fleet electrification and could be a, a way of introducing carbon capture into more recalcitrant segments of mobility uh, involving more massive vehicles, uh, where the, the size and cost of batteries for such types of vehicles uh, may be prohibitive, uh, using, certainly using current uh, lithium ion battery technologies. Uh, if uh, heavy duty vehicle carbon capture were be, to be implemented at scale, um, you know, the, we could have in, in the range of 50 to 80 gigatons of avoided emissions, emissions of CO2 by the end of the century, uh, based on uh, an introduction of these types of technologies somewhere between 2025 and 2040. And this could uh, correspond to a, an avoided temperature increase based on a climate sensitivity parameter on the order of 0 0.12 to 0 0.15 degrees Celsius, which would make a meaningful contribution to the climate stabilization target of two degrees Celsius versus increase over prehistoric levels. Uh, Zeolite 5A, uh, we suggest, could in principle effectively absorb about 15 weight percent CO2 from heavy duty vehicle exhaust under realistic operating condi uh, conditions at elevated temperature. Uh, a heavy duty vehicle pack bed absorber with heat exchange could capture around 400 kilograms of CO2 per 250 vehicle miles traveled, uh, requiring roughly 15% of the payload mass and trailer volume. And so again, uh, I enthusiastically support all technologies uh, to, uh, to reduce transportation sector CO2 emissions. Uh, uh, one thing that I think might be attractive for mobile carbon capture, focusing on uh, heavy duty freight shipping, is that there might be a good mechanism for the pass-through of cost to consumers um, for such a system, uh, more so than perhaps uh, other suggested technologies such as direct air capture might offer. Well, with that, I'll um, uh, pause and uh, thank you once again for the opportunity to speak and I'm happy to answer any questions that you... Uh, yes, sure. Uh, thank you very much, Christian, for this very interesting and uh, comprehensive presentation. Uh, we have received a couple of questions already, and I would like to also follow the timeline we have. We have a couple of minutes, so I'll do my best to address. And please do type and text your questions as I'm starting to read them. So we have the first uh, question by uh, Ludger uh, from Lutzer, I believe, our colleague. Uh, he's talking about the uh, various options of transportation in heavy duty, especially railways that uh, are quite common uh, in, in Europe as well. Uh, would you see that? Uh, those sort of capturing technology would also come uh, from the lorry trucks to also other uh, not yet so significantly major like ships or you know containers but in between as well yeah there have been studies uh, done a group in uh, Finland as they're called and uh, looking at uh, the lorries which are uh, you know class two to six type uh, smaller um, truck emissions and and there, uh, the uh, electrification is, is more attractive in terms of uh, a lower weight penalty for the mass of an onboard battery. So uh, I think there's a greater electrification potential for, uh, for lorry trucks in the European Union uh, than uh, for the, the, the types of tractor trailer rigs that are used uh, for freight across the continental United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. So we have a couple of questions. I, I uh, would appreciate also these brief answers. Uh, there was also a kind of a side philosophical discussion uh, uh, about the capturing CO2 and then using it for EOR. And one would naturally ask, well, you are going to help production of the oil. Uh, I have an answer, but I, I'm sure you have as well. So would you like to just uh, address that? That 
Well, uh, I'm an environmental engineer, but I, I you know, I, realistically, I, I think I, I, I made a, a point I made is that I think regional economies, a lot of them are very much tethered still to fossil fuel use. And it's, it's a, a really hard habit to break. And I, I think it's wise for us to work vigorously to develop technologies that might enable continued fossil fuel use uh, uh, with carbon capture and storage as a component of that. And I, I mentioned concerns about electric grid reliability. If we put all of our eggs in the renewables basket without expanding the use of, of nuclear energy, uh, we, we then could be put our, into a potential bind um, in terms of power outages. Absolutely. That's so, good. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, I mean, that, thank you very much for clarification. Uh, we have also a question from Boz. Uh, uh, he's is actually uh, quite uh, pleased to see that uh, compared to the air capture, the mobile uh, vehicle, uh, heavy duty vehicle capturing also is quite attractive. And, it's, and especially as the graph you showed, it's even more attractive and more economic. Would you would you uh, comment on the key success or key aspect that is quite competitive compared to the direct air capture of the CO2? Well, it starts with the concentration of the CO2 source emission. You know, it's, it really comes down to uh, capturing it while it's still in the tailpipe stream at a, at a relatively high volume percent mm -hmm. with the nitrogen and water vapor. If we discharge to the atmosphere, and again, I'd like to stress, I think direct air capture has an important role to play. And I've had you know, conversations with Rob Sokolow at Princeton about this, for example, who points out that, uh, I agree with you, we, we really should focus on industrial source emissions, such as our previous speaker very thoughtfully uh, covered, as well as emissions from power plants, both on coal and natural gas, and from gasoline and diesel vehicles. And I think after that, when we've captured all those emissions and we still have work to do to get to the 80 to 85% IPCC target, then direct air capture can lend a hand mm -hmm. and scrub it down. <laughs> Very good, thanks. Uh, uh, we have uh, a question related to actually the, the uh, different economies, developing co uh, economies and also uh, uh, the, the rest. So especially a uh, colleague, uh, Babatunde, I hope I pronounce uh, your name uh, uh, correctly, is asking about this uh, adaptation of these new technologies in developing countries. Would that be also something they would uh, be seriously looking at or they would focus on different aspects for now until this technology is re ready to use at scale? Well, I think there would be an opportunity actually to introduce this in developing economies from the cost standpoint. There was a recent study, you know, inspired by the Tesla semi, the electric powered uh, heavy duty truck, uh, which was looking at, you know, the cost using existing lithium ion battery technologies, you know, for a, um, depending on the amount of payload and the driving range, uh, it could be anywhere from 200 to $500,000. Uh, and even if we get to a, you know, a lithium solid state battery technology, which might double the uh, specific energy of the, of the onboard storage with an electric vehicle, you still might be looking at $150,000 cost. Uh, you know, we've done some initial estimates suggesting we might be able to, you know, use an onboard carbon capture system with an absorbent based technology in the forty to fifty thousand dollar range for that type of device. So it could be a more affordable technology to responsibly use uh, you know, liquid hydrocarbon fuels in developing economies for transportation. So, the last question I would I would read is still the time is up. Uh, I would apologize for those colleagues who would uh, feel that they would not have time to post their questions. Uh, uh, Yankin, our colleague, is asking about um, the pre and post uh, combustion capturing. In his terminology, he is actually making a, a story that you would have created hydrogen and stored C, uh, CO2, and then now here you postpone this capturing to the post combustion type of thing. Uh, in uh, your view, what, you know, where would we be going? Would we still be attracted to do this way or the other one, which might be also? an action, you know, I mean, an option. Well, pre-combustion certainly is attractive for um, separating CO2 from a synthesis gas at elevated pressures uh, and where you, you, you gather, you gain some thermodynamic advantages with, with physical absorbance. Uh, you know, one thing though uh, that uh, strikes me is that uh, a post-combustion technology might have a retrofitting capability. Uh, 
that could address vehicles that are already on the highways or will be soon introduced and could be on roadways for say 10 or 15 years. And so I think it's important to consider post-combustion technologies to address existing fleets and that bolus of CO2 that will be emitted in the coming years. Actually, since that was also my question, I'm going to also take a few seconds and ask you this question. What's the life cycle of these absorbents? For An excellent <laughs> question and more work needs to be done <laughs> uh, to study the cycling. Uh, you know, they are used uh, uh, in, at very severe conditions in some sorts of you know, petroleum reforming activities, the types of materials I was talking about, catalyst cracking adsorbents. Um, we wouldn't be looking at conditions quite that severe, but cycling would affect the life cycle um, as it does with battery electric vehicle packs as well. If you have to replace a battery pack before the vehicle's lifetime is over, uh, BEVs sometimes are less uh, environmentally friendly than IC engine vehicles. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for this very, very interesting presentation. I would also encourage the audience, please get in touch with Christian if you have uh, oh, yeah, more questions. Do. Happy to talk to others offline. Thanks a lot Thank for this offer. So I would like to